Hello dear students and welcome back to the series on modern Indian history. If you are new over here then let me tell you that this series is based on study IQ IAS's textbook modern Indian history. This textbook is like a one stop solution to all your preparation needs when it comes to modern India. Thus far in this series we have seen how in 18th century the great Mughal empire was unraveling. We have also started our discussion on how on the ruins of this great Mughal empire now regional powers were rising. In our last lecture we have seen the rise of successor states of Bengal, Awadh and Hyderabad. In today's lecture we now continue our discussion and try to understand the second type of states which will rise on the ruins of the Mughal Empire. So we have already covered the rise of successor states like Bengal, Hyderabad and Awadh. Now we are going to continue our discussion and talk about rise of rebel states. In today's lecture, we will be discussing about rise of Marathas and the Sikh power. Now let me tell you guys that although the series is based on this textbook, but I also cover a lot of peripheral things that you must know as a well-informed person. So the content of the textbook is covered, but I also try to give you additional background and you know peripheral ideas so that your concepts are very clear when it comes to modern India preparation. Let's get started with today's lecture and discuss about the rise of Marathas. Now before we dive deeper into the rise of Marathas in 18th century, we need to quickly have a recap regarding the position of Marathas at the death of Aurangzeb. We have discussed this in our very first lecture, but for the sake of clarity, it is important that we, you know, take a quick recap of it. A lot of students join fresh in the, you know, specific video. They might not have seen the earlier lectures and therefore it is crucial that we have a quick recap of what we have seen earlier. Guys, we had seen that Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj had established Swaraj in western part of Maharashtra, successfully defying the Mughals as well as the Deccani Shahis. After an illustrious career, he passed away in 1680. Post the death of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, we had seen how his eldest son, Chhatrapati Sambhaji Maharaj, became the ruler and ruled from 1680 to 89, 1680 to 89. In 1689, he was captured by the Mughals and executed. His wife and other family members, including his son Shahu Maharaj, were taken in Mughal custody. And from that point onwards, that is from 1689 till the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, they were there at the imperial capital under the custody of Mughals. So while they are away at the Mughal capital, the Maratha state is being headed by another son of Chhatrapati, Shivaji Maharaj, who is Raja Ram Maharaj. From 1689, that is after the death of Sambhaji Maharaj, from 1689 to 1700, it is Raja Ram Maharaj who will be the Chhatrapati. After death of Raja Ram Maharaj in 1700, his infant son, Shivaji II is declared as the head of the Maratha state. While he is very young, the queen mother, Tara Rani, is basically the queen regent who is controlling the entire administration and is giving a tough fight to the Mughals. With death of Aurangzeb in 1707 and rise of Bahadur Shah as the Mughal emperor, the Maratha policy of Mughals undergoes a change. Mughals have realized the futility of continuing warfare in Deccan. For 25 years, right from 1682 till 1707, till his death, Aurangzeb had spent two and a half decades in Deccan. He had died in Deccan, he is buried in Deccan without achieving anything significant. And therefore, Bahadur Shah realizes the futility of continuing this campaign and rather resorts to, you know, political machinations. Since Chhatrapati Shahu was in the custody of Mughals at that point of time, he was released and sent to Deccan. The whole idea being that the two wings of the Maratha ruling family or royal family will 
fight amongst each other leading to a civil war and in that process the Mughals will be relieved of some pressure in Deccan areas. That was the entire idea. That is what actually also happened. There was a war of succession between the two wings in which ultimately Chhatrapati Shahu emerges victorious and he bases his seat of power in Satara. So that became the Satara branch of the Maratha ruling family. The other side on the other hand was based in Kolhapur. Okay, so this is how there were two wings in the Maratha royal family. So we have understood this background. In this context, we will have to see how in the 18th century, the Peshwas are going to play a very significant role in the rise of Maratha power. Now, before we go ahead and talk about the specific contributions of the Peshwas, we need to understand the term also primarily. <coughs> the contribution of the Peshwas, Maratha Peshwas in 18th century is so huge that one tends to not know about the origin of the term per se. The term Peshwa is not of Marathi origin, it is in fact a Persian word. Okay? The word literally means foremost leader. Foremost leader, a loose translation will be like a prime minister. Okay? This is not the perfect you know, connotation of it, but then it comes close to that same idea. Bahamanis were the first to use this term, the Persian term Peshwa, in uh, the Deccan area. The famous Mahmud Gawan was a very important minister during the Bahamani times. He was, uh, you know, he made this term famous. He was the Peshwa of the Bahamani ruler back then. Successor states of Bahamanis, you know, the Adil Shahis, Nizam Shahis, they also used this term of Peshwa. And another famous name who held this designation was Malikambar. The famous Abyssinian slave boy who had come to India and risen to the position of Peshwa and virtually controlled the Nizam Shahi rule in Deccan. Malikambar is one of the fascinating characters of medieval Indian history. How a slave, you know, a young boy as a slave sold uh, in markets of Africa, he lands up in India and goes on to become the most important authority in an Indian medieval Indian state. A very fascinating story, certainly. Someday we'll discuss it in detail. So Malikambar was also a Peshwa. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj had also used this title, albeit briefly, and then later on, instead of Peshwa, the term that he had used was Panta Pradhan. Okay, he has the Ashta Pradhan Mandal, Mandal, which has eight ministers, and amongst them is the Panta Pradhan also. So this was a redesignation of the term. Now, during the 18th century, we will see three very important or key Peshwas of the Marathas who will make Marathas. Uh, you know, a formidable power in that particular period. Who are these Peshwas? Let us take a brief overview first. The first one is Balaji Vishwanath, to whose credit it goes that he, you know, laid the foundation of a rise of Marathas in the 18th century. Okay. It was through his tact, diplomacy, <coughs> his administrative acumen that Marathas, you know, were able to rise in the 18th century. Then comes his even more famous son. Bajirao I, 1720 to 1740 is his period. <coughs> I'm sure you have uh, you know, seen the movie and heard a lot of stories about Bajirao Peshwa. We're going to meet him shortly. And then after him comes his son, Balaji Bajirao, who will be the Peshwa from 1740 to 61. By this time, the de facto power will be with the Peshwas and the, uh, the ruling family will only be nominal heads. This is going to be the history of 18th century for Marathas that we are going to now try to unfold. Okay. So this is the background guys. Let us now jump into the details and try to understand the rise of Marathas during Peshwa times. In case you are wondering where you can get the PDFs of these lectures and other updates, here is the QR code that you can sign to reach my channel Jawad Kazi UPSC preparation or you can use this link also and reach me on Telegram there you can get the PDFs of these lectures. Okay. A brief announcement before we go and meet the Peshwas. We are starting with our new batches, guys, for the month of September. 11th of September, very shortly, okay, we are starting a new batch 
which is going to be a morning batch guys available in english english as well as in hindi mediums this batch is your one you know stop solution for all your civil services exam preparation needs it will take care of your prelims mains and interview preparation this batch starting from september will first build a foundation for prelims and mains then in the month of january we will transition towards preparing for prelims exam with ample you know solving uh, practice of mcqs weekly tests daily current affairs mentoring and a lot of other features that the batch is loaded with this will ensure that 2024 is the attempt where you are able to convert your dreams into reality many students who are into preparing for civil services exam try to you know grope in the darkness they try to do things by themselves guys time is much more valuable for you you are in the golden years of your life don't waste your time energy effort in trial and error methods okay instead you can enroll for this batch and leave your preparation to experts who have designed a foolproof methodology for your preparation you can use my code jd live for securing admission to this batch and get a handsome discount on the fees as well now let us talk about the first peshwa balaji vishwanath now the balaji vishwanath was appointed as peshwa by chhatrapati shahu maharaj in 1713 to his credit he was able to win a lot of maratha chiefs to the side of shahu maharaj now when the war of succession was going on when the two wings of the royal family were contesting for that seat of power a very decisive aspect was who supports which side chhatrapati shivaji maharaj had built a you know cadre of loyal sardars and after the civil war starts these loyal sardars are split between the two wings balaji vishwanath was able to win a large number of these maratha chiefs or sardars as they were called onto the side of chhatrapati shahu maharaj and that increased his weight he ensured that the issue is settled with the royal family of kolhapur constant bickering or warfare was what mughals wanted the marathas to do balaji vishwanath very well understood this strategy of the mughals so instead of allowing this conflict to fester and injure the marathas he ensured a patch up or settlement with the other branch yes shahu became the de facto chhatrapati with the kolhapur branch having you know limited sphere but then it stopped the marathas from inter nissine warfare and freed them to go on and dominate uh, you know uh, the indian subcontinent or large part of it at least in the 18th century after that after being freed from the internal issue he then turns attention towards delhi around this time in delhi sayyid brothers have raised farooq siyar to the throne we have met these very uh, you know interesting characters sayyid brothers and we have seen how they used court politics to their advantage and raised multiple princes to the throne around this point sayyid brothers were being countered by farooq siyar himself yes the same prince whom they had helped to raise to the throne was now under the influence of the rival branch you remember uh, rival nobles you remember we have seen the mughal nobles were divided into multiple you know camps there were the turanis iranis then you had indian muslims you had rajputs afghans these were camps amongst the nobles sayyid brothers were indian muslims and they were their rise was not liked by the foreign nobles who were turanis and iranis so these turanis had taken influence over the ruler farooq siyar and they were trying to oust the influence of sayyid brothers sayyid brothers therefore desperately needed some strength on their side so they tried to win different nobles onto their side and also courted the marathas this was the opportunity that balaji vishwanath peshwa balaji vishwanath used to increase the influence of marathas in delhi sayyid brothers wanted the help of marathas and in return they recognized shahu maharaj as the king of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj's dominion you know when shahu ji was released from mughal custody he was not recognized as the king 
because Mughals wanted the civil war to fester. But now, Sayyid brothers recognize Shahu Maharaj as the king of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj's dominion. He was also allowed to collect Chaut and Sardeshumki from six Mughal Subas in Deccan plus Malwa and Gujarat. Chaut and Sardeshumki. Chaut and Sardeshumki. When Shauji was released, remember we are quickly revising the facts. When he was released, Chaut was not accepted for him and only Sardeshmukhi was allowed. Then subsequently, Marathas were allowed Chaut and Sardeshmukhi, but then they were not to collect it. Mughals would collect and hand it over to them. Now one more step ahead, Sayyid brothers are allowing Chaut and Sardeshmukhi of all the Deccan Subas as well as you know Malwa and Gujarat. Okay. The independence of Marathas in Swaraj area was recognized. Okay, so for all practical purposes now, the Marathas were free to rule the way they wanted to in their traditional areas, which is called as Swaraj area, what Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj had established. 10 lakhs annual payment in return was to be paid to the Mughals for this recognition, plus 15,000 soldiers, Maratha soldiers, had to be available at the disposal of Mughals. Now, here by Mughals, we mean whom? The Sayyid brothers. So the Peshwa will support, or the Marathas will support the Sayyid brothers with a force of 15,000 soldiers in the court politics or battles of Delhi. Okay, so this is a very significant landmark in the history of Marathas, guys. Please remember this particular agreement between Sayyid brothers and the Marathas and the brain behind that was Balaji Vishwanath. Okay, Balaji Vishwanath used Chauth and Sardeshmukhi areas. Since this is granted over a very large area now, he used Chauth and Sardeshmukhi areas to win loyalty of chiefs. I've told you in earlier lectures also, you know, throughout history, whenever somebody rises up in politics, okay, the form of politics could be anything. You must be able to create some sort of patronage for people who are there below you, who support your rise. You can't rise by yourself. Just yesterday we had the festival of Janmashtami and in Maharashtra you might have heard about the practice of Dhai Handi, you know, where a, a group of people, they come together and they create a human pyramid and rise up to break that matka, which has that Dahi. So that is Dhai Handi practice in Maharashtra. So similarly in politics, when somebody is rising up to the pinnacle, there have to be people who support him from below. As he rises, he needs more and more layers below. How do you create that layers? You must have some system of patronage to those people who are below you. Otherwise, why will anybody support you? You must be able to offer them something. That is how politics works. Give and take. Yes, there are other situations also where people support for the sake of ideas. But then that is exceptional. Generally, politics works on system of patronage. So this Chauth and Sardeshmukhi areas were assigned to other Maratha Sardars so that the loyalty can be secured. Loyalty to Shahu Maharaj and also loyalty to the Peshwa himself. Okay? This although was very effective in the short term, but in the very long term, this would hurt the Maratha state later on. Okay? Sayyid brothers were thus helped in overthrowing Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was deposed off from the throne and done away with and in his place, Sayyid brothers were able to raise other Mughal princes. If you remember the names, Rafi Dola, Rafi Darjat, and then after that, Muhammad Shah Rangila, in quick successions, were brought to the throne by Sayyid brothers. They would not have been able to do that had it not been for Maratha help. Maratha forces had stood by Sayyid brothers and also travelled to North India for that purpose. That 15,000 troops that were promised were given. Real power now behind the throne was that of the Peshwa. Balaji Vishwanath, the first Peshwa of 18th century under Shahu Maharaj, had become a very formidable player in the politics of the Maratha state. All right. Office of Peshwa now became extremely powerful and also hereditary. After Balaji Vishwanath, his son Bajirao I, 1720 to 1740, will become the next Peshwa of Marathas. Okay, I hope you've seen the movie. Yes, Bollywood, you know, 
takes its own liberties and movie making is all about the way the director sees the movie but nevertheless it's a decent movie continued earlier policy of you know advancing towards north india and striking at the core of the mughal empire interference in mughal court and in north india was the fulcrum of baji rao's policy he was a soldier first and last okay he was a fighter who was always there in expeditions right at the vanguard leading his armies personally okay he was a man who lived his entire life on the battlefield basically and that's how you know he met his end also towards the end he was in a camp in a tent with his soldiers the way he had lived all his life he launched several expeditions in north india and fought all you know regional players at that time of 18th century and this in the process weakened the mughal state we have seen his famous raid in delhi of 1737 okay, where he had reached right up to the outskirts of delhi and the grand mughal army could not even respond in time and he made a statement over there and returned back quickly his style was that of guerrilla warfare okay. please note the spelling guerrilla warfare a lot of students make the mistake of writing it as gorilla warfare in answers okay gorilla is the animal guys this is gorilla okay so gorilla warfare marathas were expert in that chhatrapati shivaji maharaj had to a very effective level used the practice of gorilla warfare hit and run tactics see sanzu on a side note guys allow me some indulgence here sanzu a chinese military general has written a book the art of war more than 2000 years ago okay and in that book he has given principles of fighting wars this book is studied to this date guys in military academies across the world politicians corporate honchos everybody read it's a very small book you can you know read it in a in less than an hour's time so in this book the first principle that he gives is if you know yourself and you know your enemy if you know yourself and you know your enemy then you need not fear the results of a hundred battles so the idea of fighting wars is first you must know yourself and then you must know your enemy chhatrapati shivaji maharaj understood the mughal army's strengths and weaknesses and his own strengths and weaknesses very well he used guerrilla warfare to his advantage and this was taken to another level in 18th century by baji rao who used fast hit and run tactics okay you know some of the records make historians amazed today as to how his armies could march so fast okay he was mostly a cavalry based army and he he could you know rapidly strike at any place and quickly come out of that it is said that he also gave the idea of hindu pad padshahi while this is debated he you know many historians also point to the fact that he subdued not just you know muslims not only did he take on mughals and other mughal governors who were muslims but he also fought against hindus and personally he is uh, not supposed to be a uh, he was not a bigot as such okay and that's what the movie also tries to uh, comment his son through mastani the famous mastani his son through mastani was shamsher bahadur who continued to remain a muslim and his descendants also continued to practice islam shamsher bahadur will fight later bravely in the third battle of panipat also their descendants became the nawabs of banda they continued to practice islam so personally he was not a bigoted person as such as some would like to portray so this religious character is not uh, in attributing religious character as such is not supported historically right okay now the conflict between marathas and nizams of deccan around this point of time is very significant and prominent so we must just understand the brief background of it as per the agreement with sayyid brothers marathas were given chaut and sardeshmukhi of all the mughal provinces in deccan area now that also meant that marathas could exploit that from nizam hyderabad okay now this brought the marathas into conflict with nizam the, the nizam very often refused to pay that uh, you know right that the marathas had got from sayyid brothers and this often led to conflicts between the two this led to wars and in two famous battles battle of palkhed and battle of bhopal in these two famous battles bajirao was able to get the better of nizam so the two times 
in major battles skirmishes there were many but major battles when they met in both the occasions Bajira Peshwa was able to get the better of the other side. He also brought the whole of Malwa, Rajasthan, all the Rajput states, Gujarat and even Konkan under his control. Now Konkan was crucial because here you had the foreign power of Portuguese. Soon we are going to meet the Portuguese and other European powers. For almost a century or a slightly more than that, Portuguese had enjoyed complete monopoly on Indian Ocean region. They were the pioneers of this policy that Europeans later implemented of dominating oceans. And Konkan coast was very crucial for the Portuguese. Bajirao Peshwa was able to expel them from Salset and Basin. These are just north of the uh, Mumbai city. These were strongholds of the Portuguese and they were removed from here. He raised new Sardars like Shindes, Holkers and Gaikwads. Now the Marathas had an old aristocracy from Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj's times and the Peshwas in that sense had come later after this old aristocracy was already well established. So naturally they had certain issues with the rise of Peshwas. It's you know routine politics guys that happens everywhere. So in the process Bajirao Peshwa required you know new people who will adhere and support, uh, support to him and during his period the rise of these new Sardars of Marathas can be seen. The Shindes, Holkars, Gaikwads, the famous you know, princely states of later times, these were all created, uh, these Sardars, they rose during the period of Bajirao Peshwa. Rajputs were brought under subordinate alliance by Bajirao Peshwa. All the Rajput states were now under Marathas. Now the Maratha empire was large enough with firm holding in North India during the period of Bajirao. Now, all, while, while all of this was extremely, uh, you know, creditable, but then there were certain limitations also of this period. During Bajirao Peshwa's time, we see constant warfare, which caused a huge financial burden to the Peshwas. Wars involve a lot of cost, guys. You lose men, material, resources. Okay, you have to pay your soldiers. You have to raise new people. All of that requires a lot of cost. So the financial burden of all of these campaigns had taken a toll on the exchequer. Marathas in this period, while they were on an expansion spree, they were not able to provide sound consolidation of administration. Okay, So it was more like a territorial increase. The spread was there, but then the backbone of administration that needs to be created, and that was what was you know, lacking in this period. Many powerful chiefs were born during this period, as we noted, Shindes, Holkars, Bosles, Gaikwads, etc., etc., and uh, many of these powerful Sardars later on will become so powerful that the Maratha Empire will get a nature of a confederacy. We have discussed this word earlier, confederacy. Okay, remember whenever we talk about Marathas of 18th century, this term is often used to describe confederacy is coming together of some powers. So it was not a very compact kind of an empire it had elements which had substantial level of autonomy at their own level and they were joined together. That is the nature of a confederacy. Okay? So these powerful chiefs were created during the same period. Okay? Now, after this comes the next Peshwa who is Balaji Bajirao, famous in history as Nana Sahib Peshwa. After death of Bajirao from 1740 to 1761, this will be the period of Nana Sahib Peshwa. He was the most successful amongst all of the Peshwas in the sense that the foundation that was laid earlier was further you know, consolidated by Nana Sahib. He was a good administrator and therefore he was able to provide more sound kind of a base to Maratha rule. After the death of Shahu Maharaj in 1749, you remember 1707 he is released. And from that point onwards till 1749, he is the Maratha Chhatrapati. After his death, all power of the Marathas was now virtually in the hands of the Peshwa. Okay. Sangola agreement between the Peshwa and the Maratha ruling family at Satara made Peshwas the de facto rulers. Okay. There are two concepts, de facto and de jure. Okay. De jure is the nominal head, whereas de facto is where the real powers exist. So now, officially, the real power of the Marathas 
was with the Peshwas and their seat of power was Pune. Okay. Back then, the Britishers, they could not pronounce Pune or Pune and therefore, they anglicized that to Pune. Okay. An interesting, you know, trivial fact over here. The British cantonments here in Pune, the British officers, you know, they developed a game which we today know as badminton. You know, back then, here in this city of Pune. And that is why this game of badminton initially was known as Pune. An interesting fact there. Maratha Empire was now at the peak during the Anna Sahib Peshwa's times. Maratha forces reached in Punjab right up to Atak. Okay, that is, you know, near Indus River. Ali Wardi Khan ceded Odisha in 1751 to Marathas. We have discussed the power of Nawabs of Bengal. We have met the three Nawabs over there. The third powerful Nawab was Ali Wardi Khan. And Ali Wardi Khan was constantly harassed by Maratha raids to extract Chauth and Sardeshmukhi. Finally, he cedes Odisha, uh, you know, to secure his uh, frontiers from Maratha incursions. Okay. In 1752, Ahmad Shah Bahadur, okay, Mughal ruler, not to be confused with Ahmad Shah Abdali. Ahmad Shah Bahadur in 1752 signed a famous agreement, a very landmark agreement with Marathas. Mughals were constantly bothered by the recurring invasions of Ahmad Shah Abdali into Punjab and you know northern part of India. And Mughals did not have the kind of army that was required to face this you know doughty invader. And invasions of Ahmad Shah Abdali were very destructive. A lot of loss of life, a lot of loot, uh, you know a lot of temple destruction also. So in that context Mughals wanted to secure their frontiers especially Punjab and for that reason the then Wazir, Nawab of Awad was the Wazir at that point, he said that we must make Marathas as the, uh, you know, authority to fight against Mughals and that led to the famous agreement of 1752, the Ahmadiyya agreement as also it is called by the name of the ruler. By this agreement, Marathas became the protectors of the Mughal Emperor. Mughal Emperor is now under the protection of Marathas. So, this is a very significant, you know, high watermark for Marathas. Just imagine it was only in 1707, 1707, when Shahu Maharaj was released from Mughal custody without even recognizing him as the king of the Marathas. From that point till 1752, see the complete transformation. Marathas become the protectors of Mughal emperor under this agreement. They were especially, you know, given this task to defend the frontier, Sarhind, okay, against invasions of Ahmad Shah Abdali. Additionally, they were given the Subedari of Ajmer and Agra. Ajmer and Agra, two very crucial Subas of the Mughal, which are very in very close proximity to Delhi. So, they, since they are supposed to protect against the foreign invasion, they are given this right. Also, they are given the right of Chauth of Punjab, because they will be defending and protecting Punjab. So, their Chauth right is also extended to them. This is the famous agreement of 1752, guys. Remember, this is a very crucial background for Third Battle of Panipat. Nizam was once again defeated by Marathas, this time under Nana Sahib Peshwa, at the Battle of Udgir in 1760. Battle of Udgir, Nizam is defeated. Hyder Ali, another power down south, was made to pay tribute to Marathas. So you can see all around the Marathas are extending their influence. Rajputs were completely under the control of Marathas. Marathas very often raided Maratha chiefs. They raided Rajput territories and they also interfered in their succession related issues, extracted annual tributes and this at times led to, uh, you know, some conflicts, some conflicts or you can say a distance between Rajputs and Marathas. Finally, Nana Sahib Peshwa will, you know, see the debacle of Marathas at the third battle of Panipat in 1761. We are discussing the battle shortly. After this debacle, he could, he could not bear the grief of the loss that Marathas had suffered. His son Vishwas Rao Peshwa had died on the battlefield, a young teenage son who was supposed to take over as the next Peshwa. His nephew, Sadashiv Rao Bhau, sorry, his cousin Sadashiv Rao Bhau, he was also 
uh, you know, killed. He was in fact leading the Marathas. He was killed in the battlefield. 27 major Maratha Sardars perished on the battlefield and the entire flower of the army of the Marathas was lost on that fateful day in 1761. Nana Sahib Peshwa was grief stricken and he could not overcome that loss and he passed away very soon after that. Okay. Now, limitations of Marathas during the 18th century up to this particular point. They have complete mastery over North India, but then their style is not of empire building. It is more about, you know, extending control. They are not providing the consolidated administration as, uh, you know, empire building would require. Now, of course, since this was the first time that Maratha power had reached such distant areas, it was not possible to immediately provide, you know, sound administration, but then it remained a lacuna or weakness. Beyond Khandesh, Malwa and Gujarat, there were no administrative systems put in place by Marathas. It was mostly extracting of tributes. It was often very difficult to maintain control over these areas because the local chiefs always, you know, used to try to rebel whenever they found an opportunity. Control of Punjab, that 1752 agreement which gave this control of Punjab to Marathas, this brought them in conflict with the rising Afghan power. Okay. So, 18th century, mid 18th century is seeing rise of two powers over here. Earlier, we have discussed the rise of Ahmad Shah Abdali in Afghanistan. Okay. He was a soldier in Nadir Shah's army, an important general later. And at the death of Nadir Shah, he creates a separate kingdom of Afghanistan. He is considered as the founder of Afghanistan by Afghans even today. They call him Baba -e Afghanistan or father of Afghanistan. So in his period, the Afghan power is rising and parallelly the Marathas are peaking in the subcontinent. With the agreement of 1752, Marathas have reached Punjab. Punjab's chauth is to be extracted by Marathas. They are supposed to protect the Mughal dominion against invasion. This brought the two expanding spheres into conflict. Finally, resulting into the third battle of Panipat. Alright, so let us try to understand the brief background and see the outcome of this battle. 1752 agreement, defense responsibility on Marathas, we have understood that. Now Marathas were directly involved in court politics of Mughals. Marathas through the Wazir Imad, we have met this megalomaniac character earlier. Marathas through Wazir Imad were able to assert their control in the Mughal court politics. There was a constant conflict in the court nobility, Indian Muslims versus foreign Muslim nobles. Marathas supported the Indian Muslim nobles and Imad was in that particular wing. Foreign Muslims sought the help of Ahmad Shah Abdali. Rohila chief Najib, in our last lecture we have, last to last lecture we have spoken about Najib. Najib Khan Rohila invited Ahmad Shah Abdali to come to India. Now, Abdali claimed whole of Kashmir, Multan and Punjab. What is the base of his claim? 1739, when Nadir Shah had come to India and defeated the Mughals, at that time, a treaty was signed with Mughals, whereby these areas were ceded to whom? Nadir Shah. And Ahmad Shah Abdali claims that he is the successor of Nadir Shah as far as this part of his empire is concerned. So, he claims control over Kashmir, Multan and Punjab. Mughals dispute that and they have Marathas there in Punjab to defend them. So, conflict bit broke out between these two sides. Which sides? Marathas and Ahmad Shah Abdali over the claim that Ahmad Shah Abdali had over Punjab and Multan. Raghunath Rao Peshwa, another name to remember. He will be relevant later in First Anglo Maratha war also. Raghunath Rao Peshwa was the younger brother of Nana Sahib Peshwa. Raghunath Rao Peshwa, he was sent to Punjab because of this agreement. Which agreement? 1752 agreement. Marathas are supposed to defend Punjab against invasions. So he is sent. Raghunath Rao Peshwa is sent to sent on a North India campaign. He goes to Punjab and expels Ahmad Shah Abdali's son, Timur Shah from Punjab. Okay, so Timur Shah is forced out of Punjab by Raghunath Rao Peshwa and this was a, you know, very important, you can say, achievement of the Marathas that they were able to expel son of Ahmad Shah Abdali from Punjab and reassert control over that Suba, over that province. 
So territorially speaking, this was the largest you know, extent of Maratha sway in 18th century achieved under Raghunath Rao Peshwa. This naturally angered Ahmad Shah Abdali and Ahmad Shah Abdali was drawn to India. He is already invited by Najib Khan Rohila to come and deal with Marathas. And with his son expelled, he had all the reason to come back and fight the Maratha power. So he comes again on another invasion in 1760. And this will lead to the third battle of Panipat finally in 1761, in which unfortunately for the Marathas, and you know the Mughal uh, control over the entire region, there will be a crushing defeat for them. Okay, now let us understand the reasons why Marathas lost in the battle and what was the outcome, immediate outcome of this defeat. Reason number one, diplomatic failure of Marathas. The Marathas were not able to stitch a strong alliance there in North India which would come and fight with them against this foreign invasion. While they were fighting it out on the field of Panipat, you know, it's not as if it, the battle is fought on just one day. The Maratha campaign had started almost a year ago. Okay? And through this entire process, Marathas could not uh, you know, muster the support of other local people, other rulers of India. So this was a diplomatic failure. Shujaud Dola, the Nawab of Awadh, sided with Ahmad Shah Abdali towards the end. If you've seen that movie, this particular aspect is captured over there. Shujaud Dola, the third Nawab of Awadh, whom we, had, we have met in our last lecture, he kept on vacillating, he kept on calculating which side he should you know, actually put his strength to. And ultimately, he sided with Ahmad Shah Abdali. And this was a very decisive uh, you can say factor in favor of Ahmad Shah Abdali because Shujaud Dola was a powerful person. He had a lot of resources and that definitely tilted the scale in favor of Abdali. Supply lines of Marathas were stretched and broken. Marathas were fighting the war several hundred kilometers away from their base and therefore their supply lines were stretched. Ahmad Shah Abdali on the other hand had strategically ensured that his supply lines were kept intact and he also had the support of the local Rohilas. Najib Khan Rohila and other Afghan chiefs ensured that Ahmad Shah Abdali was uh, you know uh, always very well supplied. His army was very well supplied. Other Indian powers, Rajputs did not support Marathas. Jats initially supported but then later on turned uh, uh, you know became neutral and uh, even the Sikhs could not. Uh, in any significant uh, numbers or uh, any significant scale help the Marathas. Huge number of non-combatants. When Marathas had gone to fight the war, there was a substantial number of non-combatants who had accompanied the army and this naturally uh, affected, uh, it, 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 you know, it had a drain on the army and on the fateful day, the army also had to, you know, take care of the non-combatants. So all of this uh, ultimately added up and led to the failure of Marathas on this battlefield, but not before Marathas gave a very, very stout fight in that war. And it was on the fateful day, it was as if the Marathas may still be able to carry the day. Ahmad Shah Abdali's forces on 14 January 1761 for a brief while lost their heart and they were about to give up. But then still, Ahmad Shah Abdali's strong personality ensured that the fight went on and ultimately the tired Marathas could not. Uh, you know, uh, they were uh, starving for several weeks before that and finally uh, they succumbed in this battle. So very unfortunate thing uh, on that fateful day. Outcome for Marathas, it was a morale crushing defeat for them. This was a major loss. This was the biggest battle that the Marathas had, uh, you know, faced as an empire and it was a crushing defeat over there and that is why it was a morale crushing one. Flower of the army was lost. Remember this term, flower of the army. Okay. This is a term that is used to describe, you know, the most important part of the army. The Peshwas had fielded their Huzrat, which is, you know, they are uh, a royal cavalry as such, Huzrat. And they had also fielded uh, a European trained uh, battalion under, uh, under Ibrahim Khan Gardi. Uh, he, he was a French trained officer under the command of Marathas, from whom my mother's side, our family traces descent from that. 
So this entire flower of the army was lost in the battle and it, it led to a great impact there. Huge economic setback to the Marathas. War is an expensive business. All of that army, the resources, everything lost the entire campaign coming to naught is a huge economic impact. Prestige also suffered. When you lose a big battle, then naturally your prestige uh, amongst your peers, that also has an impact. So Maratha suffered that loss of prestige also and could never recover to earlier status. Yes, they revived after that. But then the peak at which the Marathas were, you know, that place Atak in Punjab, up to where Raghunath Rao Peshwa had led the Maratha armies, that was a high watermark of Marathas. That same level of, uh, you know, zenith, was never achieved later by Marathas, although they did revive and they became a significant power even after this, but never to the level that it was earlier. Opened the way for East India Company's domination over India. After this, East India Company will become the most, uh, you know, significant power in India. By this time, they have already won the Battle of Plassey, and in 1764, after the Third Battle of Panipat, they will win the Battle of Baksar and that will complete their control over eastern part of India, Bengal, Bihar and Orissa and that will pave the way to rise of East India Company. Had the Marathas won in the third battle of Panipat, then definitely East India Company would not have found the space to rise the way they rose in uh, you know, late 18th and early 19th centuries. Okay. So that completes our discussion guys on Marathas up to the third battle of Panipat. History of Marathas after that, after the third battle of Panipat, we are going to see when we talk about Anglo-Maratha wars, British and Maratha wars. So that is coming up shortly. Here we are limiting ourselves to major part of 18th century only. So having discussed the rise of Marathas, now let us talk about another rebel state that is the Sikhs. We have seen the concept of rebel states, those states that fought against the Mughal powers and rose to power. Whereas successor states were those states in which Mughal governors themselves asserted their independence. So we are seeing rebel states now. We have seen Marathas. Let us talk about the rise of Sikh power also in the 18th century. Now, before we understand the rise of Sikh power, we have to understand a little bit of background about the Sikhs. Now, this is uh, just a brief nutshell about the background of the Sikh community as such. Since we are focused only on the 18th century over here, that is why we are not going to go into tremendous details of this, but then we will try to understand at least the basics of it. The religion of the uh, Sikhism as a religion as such is established by Baba Guru Nanak, whose period is from 1469 to 1539. Baba Guru Nanak and in all total 10 Gurus <clears throat> are revered or worshipped in Sikhism as the Holy Gurus. They all are believed to have been inhabited by the same spirit. Guru Gobind Singh was the last Guru amongst the Sikh 10 Gurus. And after his death, the spirit is believed to have been transferred to the Guru Gan Sahib. So Guru Gan Sahib is revered as a Guru. Just as these 10 Gurus would be revered, the Guru Gan Sahib is also revered. And that is why it is treated as a living Guru. And that is why you will understand guys the... Uh, the feelings of the Sikh uh, when you know this recent controversy was going on in Punjab regarding Bayadvi, okay, being committed against the uh, Guru Granth Sahib. So you can imagine why the Sikhs are so, uh, uh, you know, they have so much of reverence for Guru Granth Sahib and that is true across all religions also. The word Sikh means learner in Punjabi. The word Sikh basically means a learner or disciple in Punjabi language. Now let us know briefly about Guru Nanak. And then we'll go on to Guru Gobind Singh and subsequent developments of the Sikh community. Guru Nanak is the founder as we have already studied. He is the social revolutionary. Now the ideas of Guru Nanak are not just limited to spirituality. Okay? The concepts that Guru Nanak has given, they, enc they encompass all the aspects of human life. It is not as if he has just spoken about uh, religion, relationship with God, spiritualism, all of that, of course, is there. But he is a complete social revolutionary who has spoken about all aspects of human life. He has given a liberal social doctrine for human beings to live. What sort of doctrine? We'll see shortly. He criticized rituals and customs. 
back then in medieval times human societies or you know religion was dominated by rituals and customs rituals and customs which did not have meaning these rituals and customs were often used by vested interest to exploit the common masses guru nanak could see through this naturally and therefore he criticizes the rituals and customs as being meaningless as being a tool of exploitation of the lay followers of different religions and therefore he unequivocally criticizes rituals and customs of all religions he said that these are used to just control the minds of the people okay if you control the minds of the people you don't need an army to subdue them you just have to control people's mind hack into people's minds and he said that these rituals and customs were basically smartly used by vested interest to control people's minds so he is against rituals and customs instead he wants freedom mental and spiritual liberation you must be free from these controls of you know other vested interest that is the aim of his revolutionary doctrine he gave the concept of an ideal man who is an ideal man like he is mentally free he is fearless okay and fearlessness is not just your physical courage it is also and more importantly rather it is also about your moral courage so free fearless and a moral being okay who will not be cowed down okay uh, you know very often we see that in the world today physical courage is common but then moral courage is often lacking people tend to comply with the herd mentality or they you know bow before the powers that be guru nanak wants to create an ideal man who will not do that he personally demonstrated it through his life okay so he wants a man who is free fearless and a moral being and he believes that this is not possible in the current community structure so we have to build up alternative structure for this for this reason he talks about a new community or a new brotherhood of people who will practice this sort of a life who will practice that ideal free man kind of a personality and for this reason the idea of sangat or congregation is born those people who believe in these values who believe in these ideas who want to be morally spiritually mentally free bold and brave those people have to come together and create a sangat or congregation and individual alone cannot do that you see a lot of ideas of baba guru nanak and kabir kabir das they have a lot of similarity okay but one reason why sikhism is a structured <clears throat> religion today is the emphasis that baba guru nanak gave on the idea of sangat or congregation this was creation of social groups based on common moral code okay so an individual alone practicing these ideas by himself will not have a big impact moreover it becomes difficult for one individual to remain committed but if you have a community community coming together who believes in these ideas then the success of that is going to be naturally much more so sangat is as an idea is given to support this idea of sangat we also have pangat pangat is where langar or food prepared is in community community kitchen is taken by all irrespective of their socio economic and other statuses and you know this very well that langar is a concept which is so central to the sikh community not just in punjab and across the country but world over gurudwaras are famous for offering langars okay i'm sure many of you would have visited and you know enjoyed a langar at some point or the other irrespective of your religion irrespective of your caste irrespective of your status you can simply go to a langar and have the meal some to a meal that is being served to you you know very reverently very respectfully by the sevadars over there so this is a beautiful concept of pangat which is so central to being a community that was given by baba guru nanak a very beautiful idea indeed political aspect of it now while all of these are there at social and you know uh, community level it is not as if baba guru nanak's ideas don't have political aspect also baba guru nanak opposed and condemned aggression and denounced exploitation of people okay so in that sense he is also taking a political stance to that extent society he says must be based on justice and brotherhood okay see these ideas which are so central to our modern day and times 
those ideas justice brotherhood equality all of those ideas you can find in these great thinkers of medieval and ancient india if rulers orders were unjust he said if the rulers orders were unjust then people were not supposed to follow them guys this is very revolutionary for that time you cannot understand the impact of it if we uh, you know we really have to go back in time and space during medieval times when the state was all powerful there was no human rights there was no media there were no independent institution state was all powerful at that point of time he says if the orders of the state are unjust then people are not supposed to follow them and this in a way according to many scholars has that seeds of defiance and challenge to authority if that authority is not moral if it is exploitative if it is unjust okay so we have to understand that he also criticized lodhis for failing to protect people against barbers invasions now when invasions used to take place the guys during medieval ancient times you know and this is common across history when invasions used to take when an invading army is coming in remember they are coming in from a great distance the army needs food it needs resources okay so whenever an invading army came on its track there was complete havoc and destruction all the villages that lay in its path they used to suffer exploitation by this invading army and how will a village of few hundred people stand up to the might of an army of 25000 30000 trained armed armed to the hilt soldiers who are away from their homeland so naturally there used to be a lot of exploitation whenever invasions took place so lodhis were criticized for that there is also economic aspect to his thought process okay he very clearly said that earnings of a person have to be honest okay earnings have to be honest you must not indulge into dishonesty you must not cheat people okay whatever economic venture you do that has to be done in a proper manner earnings of poor must not be cornered off by the rich they must not be exploited this is the teaching of uh, baba guru nanak okay so these are the aspects of his thoughts now i know uh, we are trying to you know summarize and try to provide things in a nutshell there's a lot more depth to it but then considering that we are focused on 18th century we are just taking a brief background of evolution of the sikh community the ideas of baba guru nanak the simplicity the moral tone of it struck chord with the common masses especially the peasantry in rural parts of punjab okay after his death or during his lifetime also and later after his death the ideas of baba guru nanak attained immense popularity and the uh, you know number of followers of sikhism it went on increasing guru har gobind singh during jahangir's times he came into conflict with the moguls and this transformed the sikh community which earlier the community was largely based more on moral principles uh, and all of those ideas that we discussed it gave a fighting element also to that now the idea is already there that you're not supposed to accept injustice you have to fight you have to be a moral being and that also needs practical uh, you know aspect during guru har gobind singh we see first the transformation of the community for, uh, towards a fighting one the ultimate pinnacle of this will come during the last guru guru gobind singh's times okay, the 10th and last guru was guru gobind singh singh and during his period the sikhs will become a political and military force to reckon with we see during this period of guru gobind singh towards the fag and especially there is constant war with armies of aurangzeb okay, aurangzeb and guru gobind singh had a lot of wars but towards the end uh, aurangzeb's reign we see some kind of a patch up and later bahadur shah also inducted him into mansabdari system of the moguls but this was a brief uh, kind of a bonhomie immediately after that we see that he was treacherously killed in 1600 and it and this led to a uh, you know start of a long period of conflict between moguls and the sikhs already conflict was there but with the assassination of guru gobind singh in a treacherous manner this the things uh, reached a very different level institution of guruship as guru gobind singh had uh, ordered ended with him in human form he was the 10th and last guru after that guru granth sahib was supposed to be considered as the guru by the sikhs all right fine now let us briefly see the ideas of guru gobind singh and then subsequent uh, leadership of banda bahadur he wanted to reorganize the sikhs for internal cohesion and external defense 
he felt that the Sikhs need to be strengthened internally and externally so that they can take on the challenges that the community was facing at that point of time. He, what, he resorted to the use of force for this purpose. His view is that force by itself is not an evil. Sword is a tool. How you use the sword is what you know, makes it good or bad. So force by itself is not evil. Misuse of force was evil. You have to possess force, but then you have to use it for the right purpose. You have to fight a just war, a war based on justice. He feel that the oppressor's soul, the root of the oppressor who is conducting, who is doing exploitation of people, that is dead. That soul is dead and it does not understand any language other than force. So how much ever you would plead with the oppressor about justice, about morality, the oppressor is not going to understand. Why? Because his soul is dead. And that soul understands only the language of force. So you have to inculcate, cultivate force. And for this purpose, we see that he creates the Khalsa community in 1699. Khalsa in 1699, which was a community or people living a virtuous life. Yesterday, in our last lecture, while discussing about crown lands, Khalisa lands, I had told you about the term Khalis. The term Khalis in Persian language means pure okay, or exclusive. From that came Khalisa land, which means lands that were exclusively for the crown. So, based on that same root, we also have the word Khalsa, which basically means people who are living a virtuous or pure life as such. Okay? These people would rescue others who are suffering from evil. So see, there's a beautiful coherence between what Guru Nanak says and what the last Guru, Guru Gobind Singh says. Guru Nanak is talking about morality, justice and standing up to oppression. Guru Gobind Singh is saying that for this purpose, you have to use force. Because the other party, the oppressor, is not going to understand any other language. And for that purpose, we will have to use force. For that use of force, we need a community that is pure, who practices virtuous living, who is actually having that moral courage to fight against injustice, to give all the sacrifices that are needed. Guru Gobind Singh's own sons, you know, were martyred in this process. So he is a person who has himself undergone all of this. And he creates a community called as Khalsa in 1699 for that same purpose. Now, after the death of Guru Gobind Singh, the leadership passes on to Banda Singh Bahadur. Banda Singh Bahadur was a disciple of Guru Gobind Singh. And after Guru Gobind Singh, for next eight years, it will be Banda Singh Bahadur who is going to lead the Sikh community, fight a lot of wars against Mughals and other hill rajas. Now, also we have to understand the local politics. The area where the Sikh community is rising, there are a lot of Mughal allies who are Hindu Rajas. So these Sikhs are fighting those people also. And since they are under the protection of Mughals, the Mughals are also supporting these Rajas. So we cannot see it as just as a religion based binary guys. You have to understand the larger context as well. From Yamuna to Satlaj, over a large area, Banda Singh Bahadur was able to bring the territory under his control. But ultimately, in this long warfare that he fought against the Mughals, he was defeated by Abdus Samad Khan in 1715 and captured, taken to Delhi. He surrendered, in fact, captured is the wrong word. He surrendered to Abdus Samad Khan and in Delhi, he along with his close followers were executed. This was a big setback to the Sikh power temporarily. Over the next few decades, the Sikh power could not you know, rise up to a very great extent. But after withdrawal of Ahmad Shah Abdali, we will see that the Sikhs will once again uh, revive. There will be a revival of Sikh power in the subsequent decades. Now, in the intervening period before the rise of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, from the death of Banda Singh Bahadur to the rise of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, in the intervening period, what is happening with the Sikh community there. We are trying to understand this. The Sikh community gets organized into 12 missiles. Okay? So these are, uh, you can say, communities within the Sikhs, missiles, who are dominant in different areas of Punjab. They are called as missiles. They are part 
they are you know in control of different areas of punjab these missiles were organized on the ideas of equality the teachings of the gurus the chief of the sikh missiles were largely selected on the basis of you know consensus the internal functioning of them was also based on consensus but slowly the democratic character over the decades started to reduce and these missiles came to be dominated by powerful chiefs okay so initially to start with it is very egalitarian but slowly steadily some chiefs they are able to cement their position and they come to dominate these missiles sukar chakia ahlu walia ram gadia a few examples we must know these were some of the more famous missiles amongst the 12 this being the most powerful and famous the sukar chakia missile from which came the great maharaja ranjit singh so now we will see the rise of maharaja ranjit singh guys let us talk about now maharaja ranjit singh who was the chief of sukar chakia missile of the sikhs okay. a strong and courageous soldier at the core like bajirao peshwa he is foremost a soldier but also a very able administrator and skillful diplomat so that's a complete package guys he is not just a soldier who is good on the battlefield which he of course was but apart from that he also had administrative acumen and he also had the seasoned quality of a diplomat he tried to raise a more centralized state at the end of 18th century now thus far what has happened is the sikhs are a loose kind of a uh, you know coming together of different missiles these missiles have relationship amongst each other but largely they are autonomous and independent in their own respective areas it is now the onus is now on maharaja ranjit singh to create a more compact kind of a sikh state which will have centralized power so he will try to raise such a state towards the end of 18th century he was able to successfully even repel ahmed shah abdali's invasion in uh, punjab one of the invasions that is third invasion of ahmed shah abdali in 1799 he captured the city of lahore which will become his capital and amritsar in 1802 amritsar and lahore as you would all, uh, of course know are very close to each other all sikh chiefs west of satluj river just imagine that map guys ravi bias satluj okay. on the eastern side of satluj the sikh power at that time of maharaja ranjit singh did not extend the power is concentrated on the western side parallelly here in the main part of the subcontinent around this time 1803 in second anglo maratha war <clears throat> britishers have captured delhi so the britishers also want to have a strong defense against the powerful army of maharaja ranjit singh and for that reason satluj is considered as a boundary between the two both settle at this in the treaty of 1809 that was signed between them so maharaja ranjit singh will be on the other side 18 uh, on the other side of river satluj western side whereas below the river satluj uh, you know the british control will extend okay now since his territory is limited on the east to satluj river that frees him to conquer other areas towards uh, north and northwest so kashmir peshawar and multan all of these areas uh, came under maharaja ranjit singh's control so the sikh state had the area of peshawar in his control <clears throat> this city of peshawar guys is today in pakistan in its khyber pakhtunkhwa province right now there is this conflict that is going on between afghanistan and pakistan these not western frontier areas earlier it was called as nwfp in pakistan now it is called as khyber pakhtunkhwa province now this area is inhabited by pathans <clears throat> afghanistan claims that this area should be you know part of afghanistan since it is basically the same ethnicity that lives on this side of pakistan's border the area of peshawar especially the city of peshawar and its adjoining areas uh, area of waziristan as also it is called this is especially dominated by different pathan tribes especially afridi tribes okay, you might be knowing that famous player from pakistani team shahin shah and also earlier shahid afridi they come from that tribe that dominates this area peshawar area <clears throat> peshawar is very close to the khyber pass from where you know invasions often came and trade and commerce between india and uh, central asia afghan by afghanistan was carried out so this is a very very strategic area 
the Sikh state included Peshawar in it. So a, a big part of you know the Pathan area was also brought under the Sikh state and this was quite remarkable because it was not so long ago that Ahmad Shah Abdali, you know a Pathan or Afghan ruler had controlled all of these areas. Okay, And by logic, you know, deductive logic one can say, since the Sikh state controlled this area, this area of frontier came under British control after the Sikhs were defeated. And that is why Pakistan today has this area. Otherwise, you know, it would have been under the control of the uh, uh, Afghans. And that is the dispute that, you know, often comes up. The Durand line that divides Pakistan and Afghanistan is not acceptable to a lot of these Afghans. And that is the debate that is going on at this point also. Okay. Now, let us know what were the achievements of Maharaja Ranjit Singh briefly. He transferred the old chiefs. You know, there were 12 missiles. These chiefs were very powerful. They were transformed into Zamidars and Jagirdars because he wants a centralized state, a strong state, a coherent state. So these chiefs had to be dealt with. Their powers were removed and they were made just big Zamidars and Jagirdars. Economically powerful, but not politically. He continued the old Mughal land revenue system. <clears throat> Same system. Demand was 50% of the produce. Safe passage was ensured for trade and commerce. He understood the value of economic prosperity. Every ruler understands it and especially a visionary like Maharaja Ranjit Singh. So he provided law and order, ensured safe passage of trade and commerce and that helped it to foster economically. He raised a powerful, disciplined and well-equipped army on European lines. Now he had that vision guys. 18th century is the transformation, military transformation. Traditional medieval Indian armies were about horseback cavalry. But Europeans had developed better techniques of fighting, artillery and infantry based techniques. They brought those techniques to India and used to great effect in the Carnatic Wars. Indians soon started to catch up with those techniques and to the credit of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, he was the foremost exponent of this and he built up a very powerful army on European lines with European troops and instructors, especially French officers. His army was multi-ethnic in nature. It, although the state is a Sikh state, you know, by all means, but then he is not a, uh, you know, a narrow-minded bigot as such. His army includes different ethnicities. It has Hindu Punjabis, it has Gurkhas, it has Punjabi Muslims also. It even had Pathans as well. It was the second based army in Asia, only second to East India Company's army. Now, East India Company had a very powerful army, guys. Two lakh was its strength. And its strength, East India Company's army was twice the army of Britain. The strength of East India Company's army was twice the army of Britain. Britain did not require a very big army because it's an island. It required a big navy. It had a very small army. East India Company had twice the number of troops as its mother country had. An interesting fact here, guys. He was overall very tolerant and liberal when it came to religion. He respected seers and saints of all religion, Hindus and Muslims alike. Many of his top ministers, administrators were Hindus as well as Muslims. Overall, he tried to have good relations with East India Company and signed the famous Treaty of Amritsar 1809, which was a treaty of friendship between the Sikh state and East India Company. Satlaj was agreed to as the border between these two states. Well, that concludes our discussion for today, guys. We have seen the rise of Marathas and we have seen the rise of the Sikh power. If you have not watched the earlier videos, you will get the link of the playlist in the description box. Watch all of those videos and do comment, like and share it with your friends. If you found this video useful, since you are watching it up to this point, I am sure you have, then do leave some love in the comment box below. Thank you very much. I will see you in my next lecture where we will see the rise of Jats, Afghans and other states. Thank you.